This is Jalop O'Neill Dunn with the University of Vermont, and this presentation is the second in a two-part series on remote sensing. Image processing entails a whole set of procedures. From a GIS standpoint, I'm going to cover a few of the key ones, including rectification, radiometric enhancement, spatial enhancement, spectral enhancement, and feature extraction. Rectification basically involves removing distortion from an image so that we can use it as a map within our GIS. There are a few sources of distortion. The platform, so the motion of the spacecraft or the aircraft. The sensor, we have the motion of the sensor, the perspective and detector placement within the sensor. We also have the Earth. The Earth is moving, it's got curvature, it's terrain. And then of course there's atmospheric refraction. Rectification generally involves two steps. One is transforming those coordinates. Two is resampling the pixels. So for resampling, you have to choose the appropriate resampling algorithm. Nearest neighbor, as you see on the left there, simply chooses the nearest pixel value to the rotated output grid. Cubic convolution, the example on the right, chooses a weighted average of the surrounding 16 pixels. A resampling algorithm like nearest neighbor does an excellent job preserving the pixel values but creates rough edges. Cubic convolution distorts the pixel values but provides smooth edges and thus realistic looking features. If you're using imagery within a GIS Particularly if it's high resolution aerial imagery, there's a good chance it's an orthophotograph. In orthophotographs, distortion from the sensor and from the Earth's surface have been corrected, meaning that these photographs can be used to make accurate measurements, just like a map. So every location in an orthophotograph has a known X, Y, and Z. We use mathematical procedures to account for location and orientation of the camera. Sensor records brightness values based on the reflectance of features, and the height, location, and orientation of the sensor and the recorded image are all combined to calculate corresponding location on the orthorectified grid. Not all orthophotographs are created equal. There's a difference between orthophotographs and true orthophotographs. In true orthophotographs, multiple overlapping images are taken in order to remove all distortion. So over on the right here, the top image is an orthophotograph, that is it has X and Y coordinates associated with it, and we can use it to make accurate measurements just like we would a map. However, you're going to notice that there's building lean associated with it. The bottom image represents something where a considerable amount of processing has been done to remove the building lean. That's an example of a true orthophotograph used to be considered that oblique imagery was not good for making measurements. However, a company called Victometry introduced some proprietary technology that allows them with a very specialized system to collect oblique imagery, that is sideways looking imagery, and using their specialized software package one can make both 2D and 3D measurements. Radiometric enhancement techniques are used to improve the display of the imagery. This is done often uh, within the GIS by default. Spatial enhancement involves running a filter over the image. An example of this is an edge detection filter. Spatial enhancement this is an example of a process known as a resolution merge. We're going to take a 4 meter multispectral image, a 1 meter panchromatic image, and apply a resolution merge to create the best of both worlds. The end product, what you see on the right, is a 1 meter multispectral panned sharpened imagery. So it has the spatial qualities of the panchromatic image along with the spectral qualities of the coarser resolution multispectral image. Spectral enhancement can also be used to reduce the effects caused by topographic conditions, shadows, or seasonal changes in sunlight illumination angle and intensity. This is typically accomplished through either band ratios 
or indices. The theory behind this is that while the values in the individual bands may differ, the relative values of those bands remains consistent. Here's an example of how the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, is calculated. In this particular case, we're using Icono satellite imagery, and it's the near infrared band minus the red band divided by the near infrared band plus the red band. Of course, this is all possible because satellite imagery within our GIS is nothing but numbers, so we can add, subtract, and multiply, and divide. Course imagery is digital, so we're not stuck with the standard display within our GIS. We can manipulate it. Let's look at the left here. We're looking at a QuickBird image. And over on the right is that same image with a contrast adjustment applied. Over on the right, changing things up a bit to a contrast and brightness adjustment. Another variation on the contrast and brightness adjustment. And then finally a sharpening routine. Here we are using dynamic range adjust. This is an Iconos image. You're going to notice it on the left there. It appears that the clouds have obscured a good portion of the center of the image. However, if we apply dynamic range adjust because this sensor has 11 bits or 2 to the power 11 possible pixel values, we can stretch that information out and it's quite clear that not all those clouds are dense enough to prevent light from getting through. So we can actually see through some of those clouds. One of the most common uses of remotely sensed data is to actually take that data and extract information from it. Generally three different types of feature extraction techniques, manual interpretation, what are known as pixel-based classifiers, in which each pixel is assigned to an individual, in this case, land cover class, and also object-based methods, in which pixels are grouped together into meaningful objects and then assigned to classes. Manual interpretation, of course, is historically the most common form of extracting information from imagery. It's also by far the most accurate. Nothing beats a human when it comes to image interpretation. The elements of image interpretation are color and tone, texture, pattern, shape, size, and location. And an experienced image analyst uses all of the elements of image interpretation when extracting information from remotely sensed data. Pixel-based classifiers, such as this example, which is an unsupervised classification, only make use of the spectral information. That is, they only apply the color and tone element of image interpretation, so they have limited accuracy. In this case, the unsupervised classifier, what it does is by taking a user-defined number of classes, it applies a statistical algorithm to group pixels that are similar into similar classes, and then the user has the responsibility to assign those clumps to meaningful land cover classes. Supervised classification is similar in that it only relies on pixel values. It's different from unsupervised in that the user does not set the number of classes, rather the user trains the computer by digitizing polygons to identify certain land cover classes. The appropriate statistical algorithm is then selected to assign all pixels to those classes. Here we are looking at the results of two different classifications, both supervised routines just using different statistical algorithms, minimum distance to means on the left and maximum likelihood on the right. Subpixel classification. This is a technique that's often used on moderate resolution sensors. Moderate resolution sensors such as Landsat, which has a relatively coarse resolution of 30 meters, in each one of those 30 meter pixels, you can imagine there may be a number of materials. So by using subpixel classification techniques, the relative proportion of a specific material within that pixel is detected. 
expert systems. These are used on remotely sensed data sets. They represent a rule-based methodology and they can also incorporate additional layers into the classification process. So merging your traditional GIS vector data sets with your remotely sensed data sets. Object-based image analysis or OBIA has gained popularity over the past few years. It's different than the pixel-based classifiers in that pixels are grouped together into meaningful objects. And in object-based image analysis, the procedures most closely mimic that of manual interpretation because you can apply all the elements of image interpretation. You're not just limited to color and tone. Now let's take a look at some examples of remotely sensed data, specifically the properties of various sensors. For the legend on the right, we're going to look at the source, the sensor, the spatial resolution, the spectral coverage, and the radiometric resolution. In the spectral cover legend there, the grayscale indicates the panchromatic band, blue is the number of blue bands, green the green bands, red the red bands, the magenta there indicates near infrared band coverage, the Dark yellow indicates short and mid infrared band coverage. And finally, the last square with the purple to yellow gradient indicates thermal coverage. And we'll also look at the radiometric resolution. So here we are looking at an example of panchromatic film. So in this case, the sensor is a film-based system, which is then scanned, or the rectification is conducted, and so then we bring the product into the GIS as a digital image. It's an example of the Vermont author photos from 1990s. The spatial resolution is half a meter and it's black and white because it only has one spectral band. That is, assigning those bands to the red, green, and blue color guns because there's only one band produces a black and white image. Notice that the radiometric resolution here is 8-bit, so the data was scanned in so the pixels have a possible value of 0 to 255. Here's an example of color film. Once again, similar to the previous example, we have a film-based sensor. In this case, it's Dutchess County. The spatial resolution is 0.62 feet, so very high resolution. You're going to notice that the spectral coverage there, it's got three bands, a blue band, a green band, and a red band. Red, green, and blue being the primary colors of the electromagnetic spectrum, hence by assigning those to the red, green, and blue color guns in our computer, we can make the color image that you see here. Most scanned film products that you'll run into all have 8-bit radiometric resolution. Here we are looking at another example of aerial photography, only in this case a digital imaging system was used. The advantage of digital imaging systems is that the imagery does not have to be scanned in this case, we're looking at a company which is now defunct called Emerge. Their digital camera, this is in the Baltimore, Maryland region. And this sensor specifically has a green, red, and near infrared band. And so what we're looking at here is a color infrared composite. Similar to the film based systems, we have pixels with a value from 0 to 255, making it an 8 bit system. Iconos 2 was the first high-resolution commercial satellite to be launched by a company in the United States. It's interesting in that it has a high-resolution 1-meter panchromatic band, so black and white, and then it has a 4-meter multispectral capability in which it senses blue, green, red, and near-infrared. Unlike the aerial systems that we saw, it has a radiometric resolution of 11 bits, and it can revisit single point on the Earth's surface every three to four days and acquires imagery in approximately a 13 by 13 kilometer area. Some more examples of Iconos imagery, panchromatic example on the left and multispectral on the right. Quick Bird 2, slightly higher resolution than Iconos, can get down to close to 60 centimeters in panchromatic mode and just below two and a half meters in multispectral mode. Very similar to Iconis in that it has a single panchromatic band, then blue, green, red, and near infrared multispectral bands. It's also 11-bit radiometric resolution, 
has a similar revisit time of three to four days, but the scene size is a bit larger at 32 by 32 kilometers. Some quick bird satellite images here. Of course, you're going to notice that if you look at Digital Globe, there's quite a bit of quick bird imagery in Google Earth. Landsat was really the first commercial satellite. It's owned and operated by the US government. The most recent Landsat, Landsat 7, has a panchromatic mode at 15 meters, a multispectral capability at 30 meters, and then a thermal capability which senses at 60 meters. So that one panchromatic band has a 15 meter resolution. The multispectral bands, blue, green, and red, near infrared, and two others in the short and mid-wave infrared all have 30 meter resolution and that one band out in the thermal is a 60 meter resolution. It's an 8-bit sensor. It can revisit the same point on the Earth's surface every 16 days. You notice that the scene size is considerably larger than the high resolution systems, 185 by 185 kilometers. Some examples of Landsat imagery in Vermont, in the St. Albans Bay Example is particularly interesting as you can see there, there's little wispy patches of green or actually algal blooms. Here's an aster image. Aster has varying spatial resolutions in the visible and near infrared bands. It has a green, red, and near infrared band. Those all have 15 meter resolutions. Out in the short and mid wave infrared, has six bands, all have 30 meter resolution, it has five thermal bands, all at 19 meter resolutions. Depending on which band you're talking about, it either has 8 bit or 12 bit radiometric resolution. The temporal resolution varies because it's an on demand system and it has a scene size that's 60 by 60 kilometers. Some master examples here. <coughs> 